находимся в штабе. 7 часов 30 минут утра. А то, с чем мы столкнулись, это именно предательство. What do you think you've learned uh, from what happened the 23rd uh, and 24th of June, and what are you going to be watching for now? I would say that I learned that the system looks more fragile than I thought before, and I think everybody in Russia who believed or still believes in the stability of this regime, they would have to reconsider their estimates, and uh, this is the main lesson. It also shows how, how Russia works. At the same time, it shows that maybe it will not work like this in the future. Because Prigozhin, who was Prigozhin? Yes, in Pri with Prigozhin, they tried to outsource the security. Yes, the military. I think this, this lesson shows that they would have to reconsider the policy to outsource the security because it, will, it could hurt them, yes, it could threat to them because to the stability of the regime, that's, that's the, one of the lessons we've learned. I mean, th there was this hypothesis, right, that the coup proofing that the Kremlin was doing was of setting up different competing military structures. So you lose your monopoly on violence, mm -hmm. but none of them can get so strong as to present a challenge. Mm -hmm. But then one of them didn't actually get all that strong, but mm -hmm. presented a challenge. And I find that really interesting because, yes, the goal was not the overthrow of Putin. Mm -hmm. But if your goal is the overthrow of Putin, you've got something of a blueprint now, right? You've got a, you've got a way forward. Yes. On the other hand, I'm also not sure what, what you learned from this if you are planning to overthrow Putin, right? Mm -hmm. Clearly learned that the Russian people as a whole are going to probably stand and watch and go home and try to stay out of it and maybe take some pictures on their cell phone. You've learned that it's not clear which parts of the other security forces will do what. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, uh, I still don't know how you would go about, you know, I, I still don't know if, how anybody's going to go about trying. Yes, that's true, that's true. But, you, you know, in the course of this war in Russia, a lot of people were discussing that this war would promote new heroes, like because the war it's about leadership, yes, it's about charismatic persons, about warriors, and they were all saying that these people will appear in the course of these wars, and sooner or later these people would come to to Russia, and they would have their own place in Russia domestic But they're not getting heroes on the battlefield. They're getting failures on the battlefield. They're getting generals swapped out. So. What you've got is Prigozhin, who is angry that he doesn't get the supplies, right? He blames the military leadership for not giving him what he needs to be that hero. And he's not a hero exactly. He's a celebrity. Everybody knows who he is. Yes, that's true. But, you know, it's not as though there are a lot of people who think, yes, this is the guy I want running Russia. He's not. He's not. He's a celebrity. Yes, absolutely. And he invested a lot on his uh, promotion. I mean, PR promotion and his publicity, yes, and he was very careful about his public image. But he pretended to be like this a new personality, this new hero of the war, yes. He pretended to be a fixer or a man who could fix this war and at the same time who could change like the system because we've been observing, yes, how his message were changing, that in the beginning it was about the Wagner, yes, uh, when he understood that the Wagner could cease to exist, yes, it was about Wagner, then he, his message became more and more political, yes, he started to say about how Russia is waging this war, yes, how Russia is unsuccessful, he was saying that the military were deceiving Putin, yes, and Putin uh, didn't have all of the information, and his, his message was changing, but he, it seems that he understood that he had to use political message to keep his business. And why, why did he do it? Prigozhin uh, decided to do what he did because he understood the weaknesses of the Putin's regime. He understood that the military couldn't stop him. He understood that there is nobody between Russian forces in Ukraine and Moscow. Uh, yes, he understood that the FSB doesn't work well. And he understood that everybody 
would just observe and I think the personality plays a huge role here with Prigozhin. I mean, Prigozhin, he used what system gave to him, yes, and he, he was one of these, like, unofficial officials, yes, but his type of personality was also very important because he was nobody in 1990s. He was not from the elite. He has a criminal past, and he was like a self-made man, yes, but at the same time he had huge ambitions. Yes, he wanted to be like one of these Putin's oligarchs. He worked like a waiter at Putin's events. And at the same time, he was always interested in politics. He was always listening to the conversations. He asked people to listen to the conversations between, I mean, the Kremlin's guy, and he, he asked these people to inform him about his conversation. So he, he always wanted to be insider, and he always wanted to be like them to have the same influence. And he understood that if he loses Wagner, he, he would lose uh, like the dream of his life, it's to be like they are. And that's why he was so decisive. We are in the staff, 7 hours 30 minutes at night, under the control of the military objects in Rostov, the other thing that I really think about a lot is that the crackdowns in Russia have really focused on the liberals, on the left, on the people who want more democracy, the people with ties to the West, uh, the, you know, the people who want a change of government, but they want a change of government to more human rights. And those people end up in prison, uh, or those people end up leaving. The Russian uh, state has given more and more space to the right wing, to the people who want more war, to people with narratives of um, men are men and women are women and men fight, you know, sort of th this, this imagery, but that's where the threat came from. Yeah. And you don't see them trying to shut it down, right? You're, they're still leaning on this. This is still their narrative. Why aren't they more nervous about this? I think they understand that they are dependent on these people right now. I mean, on all of this uh, pro-war pro bloggers, pro-war opinion leaders, because without them it would be difficult for them to explain uh, to the society that Russia needs to, to wage this war. I also wonder about the decision to pull in Lukashenko and uh, I wonder, I mean, that was not one I expected, right? Lukashenko saves the day. Um, and we're seeing now, even in the Russian media, we've seen them roll back the idea that Lukashenko was actually as central to the negotiations as he himself has said he was, uh, the idea being that it's cover, right? That, Luka, that the decisions were made and Lukashenko was brought in to say, yes, fine, um, I will, you know, Wagner is going to come to Belarus, whatever's left of it, Prigozhin can come to Belarus, and it's kind of a house arrest, right, for them. And maybe some of the Africa operations will continue to be run from Belarus. We still don't know. Maybe they'll be taken over by mm -hmm. other organizations within Russia. Um, but do you think Lukashenko gets anything out of this in the end? It's a good question because, you know, the, the common understanding was that, that Lukashenko is fully dependent on Putin, yes, and on Russia. That, and that's and true. And now he's just done but Putin now, a big favor. But now the situation, this situation shows that Putin is also partly dependent on Lukashenko because Lukashenko is the, his only ally. That's true. He, he has, if, if, if Putin has problems, and we've seen from this situation, nobody would come to help him except Lukashenko. And it seems, the, yes, that Lukashenko helped him. And of course, the, it, he did this because he, he explained this by himself, that he knows Prigozhin a lot. But, you know, because I think Lukashenko understands that if Putin fails, I think he was saying this, he was explaining that if Putin failed with this, Lukashenko would have problems. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I don't think, I, yeah, I don't think that, that's a stretch. That he, didn't, he, he, he doesn't want to, to, to see his country destabilized again. 
Yes, and he understands that. Well, he doesn't want to lose power. Yes. I don't think he's worried about his country being destabilized. Yes, he's he worried about himself being power. destabilized. Yes, that's true. Mm -hmm. That's true. And they helped each other, yes. And uh, this is, of course, a new situation that Lukashenko could be very useful for Putin and not, not being just uh, Putin's puppet. And it shows, yes, in, in a critical situation, he could play a role in yeah. Russia. And that he's useful to Putin as yes. somebody who he can point to as a fellow head of state. Absolutely, I think that's a yes. really important point. You don't want to subsume Belarus but entirely. He's only one. Not yes, China, not China, not no, Kazakhstan. No, everybody else not just, up. Oh, internal no. matter, we're yes, going to wait and see what happens. Who could, who could help what, you know, what's interesting is we never got a readout of the conversation with Mirzi Yoyev of Uzbekistan, right? We got the readout from Kazakhstan mm -hmm. with Takayev saying it's an internal matter. Mm -hmm. uh, Lukashenko came and helped. But we know there was a conversation with Uzbekistan's Mirzi Yoyev, but no readout, nothing about yes. what was said. It's interesting, yes. And f as far as f uh, Kazakhstan is concerned, we remember the situation in January 2022, Absolutely. when Putin helped enormously uh, to, to Takayev, yes. And then I think, so Takayev... Takayev did not return the favor. He legitimized his, uh, like, power takeover using Putin, yes. And he didn't do the same. He even didn't say, like, warm words to Putin. He didn't say that if you had if you have problems, we would come. Well, nothing like he invading a neighboring like state to make the other neighboring states not so friendly. It's yes, really, um, it's amazing how that works. Yes, yes, and I think this, of course, I think Putin understood that he he was alone. But now this his sense of loneliness and his sense of insecurity uh, will be only growing. I think it's a good time for him to to rethink what happened, how, how the war has changed his neighboring countries. And how they look at him. No, I think that's right. I think it's, it's really interesting. I think the other thing that's interesting here is you've got all of these stories about who knew. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's very in character for Prigozhin to say, I could do something, but would he actually do anything? And the most interesting thing here, what the FSB was thinking about, did they also think that this conflict was happening because it's in Putin's interest to criticize the military. Yes, we know a lot that Putin didn't trust military in the past. He never he never wanted a big army. Yes, he was against the big army. A long history. Well, that was back when they were trying to reform it. Yes, right? for the Russian military, I mean. And they were all thinking that this conflict was happening because of Putin. And when it started, the first reaction was, they, of course, he, they were paralyzed, but they were paralyzed because they were thinking that it was not possible that it could happen without Putin's yeah. approval. That's why they kept distance, because they were waiting because they wanted to understand Putin's reaction. And of course, when Putin said that it was a treason, that uh, he didn't name Prigozhin, yes, but he said that we should do, we should behave, we should act against this. Treason, yes. А то, с чем мы столкнулись, это именно предательство. Непомерные амбиции и личные интересы привели к измене. And they, of course, their minds had changed. They understand that it was real. But at the same time, they understand that something happened inside the system. Uh, and the, the main question is still the question why Putin didn't prevent this. And they keep asking these questions, why, why he didn't prevent this, if he was against this conflict. If this conflict was not in his interests, why he why he ignored this conflict? Well, because he thought it was in his interests. He did not expect this. I mean, I think, you know, for me, the strongest evidence that they were caught off guard was that Saturday morning announcement that Vladimir Putin will address mm -hmm. Russia, and then the address, the in-person direct address, is canceled, mm -hmm. and then shortly afterwards, a recorded address comes out, mm -hmm. demonstrating that they were nervous about doing this live. Now, why you would be nervous about doing this live, it's exactly the same, right? It's, it's still, you know, you go into a room with a camera in front of you and you talk. Mm -hmm. It's the same whether you record it or you do it live. But for some reason, they were nervous about doing it live, and I find that fascinating. And I think, I, I really see that as, um, you know, kind of a, the smoking gun evidence that they were not prepared, they were shocked. They woke up on Saturday morning as surprised to find Prigozhin has taken Rostov on Don as all of the rest of us were. Mm -hmm. Um, I agree, yes. 
So do you think they can, can they even get rid of Wagner? They spend so much time creating Wagner as a thing. Big buildings where they're scraping the logos off of now. Is Wagner gone or is Wagner going to morph into something else? The fact is, yes, that they invested so much in Wagner, in the Wagner's brand, yes. They promoted Wagner on the state television, they made reports about Wagner, and it was a very, it was a big brand, and you could see a lot of adver Wagner's advertising in Russian, in the Russian cities and uh, on the internet, everywhere. And it would be difficult to get rid of this brand, yes, it will be difficult to, to make it disappear. But I think that Wagner as a as a big organization in Russia it's over but the the system the model they used especially the model they used in Africa and in Syria I think it would not disappear then they use like contractors volunteers to achieve like political and security goals outside Russia not uh, not pretending that they are part of the Russian state Yes, and it's interesting that uh, Russian officials said that uh, Wagner made contracts with African leaders, yes, and these were contracts between a private company and the states, not between Russia and yeah. the states. And it means that they continue to fulfill their commitments. I think we'll see like an interim period, yes. We'll see a period like a temporary solutions. But in the end, of course, if this, if this regime keeps existing, they would not get rid of this model. Yes, they would, they would continue to use this model everywhere because it was very useful for them. Wagner was a very important part of Russia's presence outside Russia, especially in Africa. They understand that their, their type of presence, it was efficient from Russia's point of view, and it also was accepted by local leaders. So it was this model of Russia's presence was very comfortable for African leaders, for, for African authoritarian regimes, because they were not Russian troops. It doesn't look like colonization. Yes, it doesn't look it's like... It's just a business deal Yes, it's a business a deal. It's very, it's, very, it's very useful models for these countries. And I think that the Kremlin understands this, and it means that, that they would try to, to keep this model functioning, yes, in the future because it's it's it was comfortable for everyone for convenient it was convenient for everyone